Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning to uh, Friday Morning Devotions. Again, here we are at the end of another week, and uh, just want to say thank you for uh, joining all week and listening, and I hope it's been a blessing and an encouragement to you. And uh, really, I enjoy doing this um, very much. Um, next week, though, will be my last week doing this. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of weeks off until the new year. So next week will be the last week of devotions and then two weeks off and then we'll be back in uh, in January. So uh, we're going to going to take the going to take the two weeks off and, and really start thinking about the uh, the Sunday school or the Bible class lesson that we're going to be looking at at Open Door dealing with Revelation. And I know probably I think some, well, I know some of you already your church is doing Revelation and going through that. So um, something that I've been planning for a while. So looking forward to doing that. So I'm going to take two weeks off to really uh, focus on that for a little bit <clears throat> and uh, just have a little bit of a break as well. We will be on Sundays, obviously. I'll be, I'll be at church on Sundays preaching. So we'll have that. Uh, we'll have that. Um, and we'll have that streamed Facebook live, whatever you want to call it. So uh so there you go. Uh, be praying for your service this weekend, as always, being Friday. May I remind you to be in prayer about that. Carol, good morning. Tracy, good morning. And uh, may God bless you on uh, on Sunday as you assemble with your, your, your brothers and sisters in the church that you go to. Pray that it'll be a great day. The presence of the Lord be real. Lucy, good morning. And uh, Judy, good morning. And just uh, do pray that you'd uh, keep that in prayer, keep everything in prayer about that. All right, I was a little bit in uh, three minds. How's that? I've got three minds. I'm, I'm the Trinity. <laughs> I've got three, three minds. Um, I was in three minds, actually, as, as what to share this morning, because I had a few ideas and uh, just uh, like, which one, Lord? You know what I mean? Which one? So let's, let's go to Acts 14. We're going to go to Acts 14 this morning. Acts 14. You know, there are not too many people. Well, how do I say that? Not too many people. There's probably not too many groups that you would know that would um, uh, run from a fight. All right, run from a fight. Uh, you know, you've got your different, uh, uh, you know, your motorcycle gangs that'll just stand and fight, and you've got different, you know, different political groups that'll get together and fight and and you know argue and, and all that. And and as Australians too, you know, our um, that Anzac spirit, you know what I mean, to uh, to just stand up and fight. Jean, good morning. To not run from a fight and Anzac, you know what I mean, and and what that means to us as Australians and how that uh, you know the that Anzac spirit. Uh, but you know, it's interesting. It's interesting when you think about the the whole idea of of running or fleeing from a fight, fleeing from a fight. And this morning, I want to talk to you on this thought: the fleeing fundamentalist. <laughs> <laughs> the fleeing, fleeing fundamentalists. And I say that because it's like, you know, having grown up in, you know, well, since 1980, since I was 10, having grown up in church, and what we would class as a uh, as a fundamental, you know, Baptist church, uh, and, and just the whole idea of that, where we see the term fundamental or fundamentalist is, is very much changed today. And there's a lot of other cultures, a lot of other religions that would be classed as fundamentalists. Uh, Islam would be a fundamentalist group, you know what I mean, or offshoots of Islam, Lindsay, good morning, <clears throat> known as fundamentalists. You know, the thing about fundamentalism, which is, which is interesting as Baptists, because, you know, we like, to, uh, we like to think ourselves as, as fundamentalists and more importantly, fighting fundamentalists. Uh, we often think that fundamentalism started, you know, with a man by the name of Jack Hiles, who's with the Lord now, and and Jack Hiles was was the father of fundamentalism and all this sort of stuff, which couldn't be further from the truth, because fundamentalism started back in the 1920s and 30s, and it didn't start with the Baptist Church. It actually began with the Presbyterian Church, because the Presbyterians were fighting against liberalism, modernism. Now, Baptists adopted that, and it's a good thing to adopt as far as fundamentalists, and what you'll find is that in the 1920s and 30s, the Presbyterians took a stand to fight against this liberal ideology that was creeping into Christianity. And they laid down five fundamentals, five fundamentals that that were to be fought for. All right. And, and they were this. Let me read this to you. They were biblical inerrancy, uh, the, the divine nature of Jesus 
Which again, you know, even thinking about that, I've been watching some things this week and the and the fighting, toing and froing between different people about the Trinity and 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 the nature of Jesus and and the God Man and uh, His divinity and His humanity, all this sort of stuff. It's like, what in the world's going on? So the divine nature of Jesus, the Virgin Birth, the resurrection of Christ, and His return. So they were they were the five fundamentals that the Presbyterian Church put out there that this was this is where the line is drawn in the sand. You cross that line and we're fighting you for it. And again, as I said, Baptist adopted that. Hey, good thing to fight for, no doubt about it. Wonderful thing to fight for when you wanna when you want to deal with these things. But you know, when you think about the the, the fight in the, the modernist in, in the 1930s, 40s and so on, I remember reading books by John R. Rice and you know, the, the fight against liberalism. And then you think about the birth of the independent Baptist church, where you think that independent Baptists really, really were born out of fighting because they were, they came out of the Southern Baptist convention fighting against the very thing that the Presbyterians were standing up for. They were fighting against the the modernism, the liberalism that were creeping into the Southern Baptist Convention and especially their their seminaries, right? So so independent Baptists were 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 born in in that fighting type of mindset. Uh, you had some very well known people that came out of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, you had uh, uh, oh, his name escapes me now. Uh, J. Frank Norris came out, you know, and then you had uh, John Rice and Lee Robertson and Hiles and all these guys that were fired. They pulled out and became independent. And so we've been known as a as a movement, as as one who were were, were fighting fundamentalists. Well, the fighting over the fundamentals or fighting for the fundamentals now has expanded beyond that. And it just seems to me that anything that moves or anything that breathes or any any kind of language that doesn't line up with what I think is right, we want to fight against that. And we're becoming we're becoming known as a movement for more of our fighting and arguing and, and contention and all this sort of stuff than than contending for the faith, yeah, absolutely, but not being contentious. And now we just seem to think that, you know, if you run from a fight, then you're a coward and all this sort of stuff. And if you don't stand and fight for what's right, blah, 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 and all this sort of stuff, you know what I mean? Well, not every not every situation requires a fight. And I want to look at two fleeing fundamentalists this morning. And uh, you would want to think that these two guys were fundamental to the core. So let's have a look at Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas, because they're, they're out in their first missionary journey. They're preaching the gospel around Iconium. And, uh, you know, people were getting upset. The Jews were getting upset. And because the Jews were upset, they were getting the Gentiles upset. And it was just a big, it was a, it was a, it was a very hostile environment. No doubt about it. Very hostile environment. It was like a powder keg ready to explode. And right in the midst of all this is Paul and Barnabas. Verse 4 says, But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them being Paul and Silas, they were aware of it and fled under Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and under the region that lieth round about. So they fled. They took off. Now, why didn't you stand and fight, Paul and Barnabas? Why didn't you just do that? Well, as I said, they fled in order to fight another day. There is no shame in backing away from a fight if you know that it's it's not going, you know, if it's not going anywhere and, and, and you want to back off and think, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to focus on somewhere else, right? Because if there's one thing that you and I should be made aware of of the devil, he just likes to throw those smoke grenades in there, make a lot of whiz-bang noise and get everybody focused in different areas and away from what should be right. And so when, when Paul and Barnabas were aware of the very fact that they were going to be stoned and mistreated, they took off, they fled. Now, let me just say that that is nothing really that is uncommon in the sense that there were times where God told his man to flee. 
As a matter of fact, in 1 Kings 17, dealing with Elijah, it was, it was Elijah that, that, the, that God told to take off and hide in Cherith. All right, so in 1 in Kings 17, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God liveth, for whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So he, he confronted Ahab. He told him the truth. He told him what was going to take place. Now, verse 2 says, The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. In other words, run and go and hide yourself. Hang on a sec. <laughs> well, listen, there's reasons behind that. Not every situation requires someone to stand and fight. Kim, good morning. Now, later on, now in 1 Kings 17, God told Elijah to run. In 1 Kings 19, God never told Elijah to run. He took it upon himself to take off when he heard that Jezebel was after him. Because, because he was scared about that, he just took off. God never told him to flee at that time. So when I look at that, I think you should have stood and fought, and fought against what was taking place. But he didn't, he took off. So there was a, there's a time to flee, there's a time to run, and there's a time to make a stand and fight against certain things. But you've got to be discerning. You've got to be discerning. Luke chapter 14, let me read this to you for a minute. Luke chapter 14, this is where Jesus says to, to pick your battles. All right, in Luke chapter 14, and uh, he talks about dealing with discipleship and so on. Uh, he says in verse number... Um, Verse 30, uh, no, verse 31. Or what king goeth to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth where he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. So the first thing he does is he sits down and consults. You know, most people, when they get into a Barney, they get into a fight, whether you're fighting against uh, liberalism, modernism, you're fighting it, sin or whatever, most people, if you want to fight against some other religion or fight against some other denomination, most people don't sit down and, well, let's just think about this for a minute. Is this a fight that we want to get involved in? Is this a battle that we really want to get involved in and have a loss of life? Because there's always casualties of a fight. There's always casualties of war. Metaphorically speaking, in the spiritual realm, there's always casualties when, when there's a war that breaks out in a fight. Lynn, good morning. People are hurt. A lot of church people leave church because of the stupidity of what's going on, all right? So verse 32, or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all, and he hath, uh, and he, and hath he cannot be my disciple. So in other words, what Jesus is saying there is, is pick your battles, pick your battles. So when we go back to Acts chapter 14, we see that Paul and Barnabas just took off and fled. They fled. They fled in order to fight another day. It was not a battle. It was not a fight that they wanted to get involved in. Now, do you think that God could have kept them safe if people were coming? Paul's seen that in his life, right? Paul's seen God protect him in his life. But at this particular time, he said, right, now let's go. This, this, this is just getting out of hand. This is not a fight that we want to get involved in. Let's go somewhere else. So they fled in order to fight another day. And we ought to think about that. We ought to think about it. There's plenty to fight against, right? And I'm talking about in a spiritual nature. I'm not talking about fussing and fighting against family, friend, whatever. Christmas time, we don't, you know, <laughs> some households like to fuss and fight over a number of different things. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this, the spiritual battle that's out there. Now, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 talks about being a good soldier. So, you know, as Christians, we've got in our mindset being soldiers of Christ. And we think as being a soldier, um, you know, we're, we're ready for battle. And, and we should. But also, when Paul mentions us being as soldiers, we are in, in submission to our commander-in-chief, right? The captain of our salvation. We take his orders. And then he says this to Timothy. He says, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. All right, so no man that war, if, if you're going to go to battle, if you're going to go to war and you're fighting over a good thing, you're fighting against sin, you're fighting against whatever, 
Make sure you don't get entangled up in the affairs or you shift your focus of the fight over here and you go and pursue this because it could be that the devil's just making a bit of noise over here and we go running over here where we should be focused in front of us. So there's, there's a time and a place to dig your heels in and fight, but then there's a time and a place to uproot and flee, just leave. Just leave the situation, right? For example... In 1 Samuel 17, when David goes out to Saul and the army, remember his dad tells him to take the cheeses and that, go and see how your brothers are doing. And he gets there and he's here and Goliath ranting and raving and carrying on. And he's, David's asking some questions and what's this guy? And Eliab, his older brother, confronts him and starts accusing him and belittling him and so on. And, and all David says was, is there not a cause? He turned his back on, on his brother Eliab and went in another direction. He did not stand and fight with his brother while there was a bigger fight to take place in regards to Goliath. And sometimes we're squabbling and fighting over the little things when there's bigger things to fight for. There's bigger fish to fry than focusing on the small stuff. All right. So they flee. And here's the thought. They fled in order to be led to a greater purpose. They fled in order to be led to a greater purpose. Have a look at it in Acts 14. They've gone to uh, Lystra and Derby, uh, cities of Lyconia, verse 7, and there they preached the gospel. There they preached the gospel. Now we're going to see the power of the gospel at work. Now, I love the... Um, I love the scriptures. I love the literal meaning of, of what's being said here. Because here is, a, here, is a, uh, here, is, here is the power of the gospel that's going to be preached. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. We know that, right? And oftentimes we, we, just, we just buttonhole the gospel. And, and just please hear me out for a minute. We buttonhole the gospel in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Okay. And that is the gospel. But the gospel also contains the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel is the good news of Jesus. And the reason why I say that is because they come across this man that has a predicament. And in verse number 8 says, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, this is where they're preaching the gospel, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. So now we're dealing with the predicament of this man. Now, we could spiritualize this, say that he was crippled by sin and all of that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with making a spiritual application out of that. But the literal meaning, the literal reading of this is that here is a man who has a physical predicament. He's been crippled since his mother's womb, never walked. He's in this situation. He's, he's watched his mother beg for him. And then as he's gotten older, he's gone out and begged because he can't walk. And if, if you don't beg and make money that way, you're not going to survive and all this sort of So his whole life has been one of hardship, right? And then Paul comes and preaches the gospel to a man who is struggling physically, to a man who probably is also struggling emotionally. Come on, wouldn't you be struggling emotionally if you had had this whole situation brought upon your life? Now, you've grown up with it, but, but the older you get, you see kids walking around and other people walking around. You think, how come my legs are not well? How come I was born like this? And, and, then, and then that spiral down with, of, of discouragement and depression and the emotional angst that is brought upon the individual. And along comes Paul and Barnabas who came and preached the good news of Jesus Christ. And so the predicament of this man was changed. Now, if Paul and Barnabas had stood way back and fought against this divisive nature back where with the Jews and the Gentiles and they had threatened to stone him and all that sort of stuff, if Paul had stayed and, and confronted that, this guy might have missed out. But because they fled, there was a greater purpose. And God always has a greater purpose in life for you and for me, for your church, for our church, right? So we see the predicament of this man. And Paul preaches the gospel. Now, let's read on. The same heard Paul, verse 9, speak. Now, what was he speaking? Well, he was speaking the gospel. He was preaching the gospel who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. So now we see the perception of this faith. Paul's preaching the gospel. Here is a lame man. 
His predicament is is terrible, right? His, his living conditions are probably just as bad. And Paul's preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. So in the good news of Jesus Christ must have been the testimony of the miraculous work of Christ, the healing ability of Christ, the delivering ministry of Christ. All of that is good news to folks who need the Lord Jesus Christ. For the sinner, he is the saviour. For the sick, he is the healer. For the one who's in bondage, he's the deliverer. He is all things to all men. And that's what we've got to think about. He is all things to all men. All right, so now we've got this perception of faith. This man is hearing Paul preach about the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul's watching this man and he perceives that in this, this man is the faith to be healed. All right. Verse number 10, and he said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet, and he leapt and walked. So the power of the gospel at the start, the predicament of the man, the perception of his faith, and now we see the power of God enacted through the preaching and, and, and the faith that was stirred in this man. What a, what a greater purpose. What a greater purpose that Paul and Barnabas turned their attention towards. They could have stood and fought back there in, uh, in, in, in Iconium when, when there was that great division. They could have stood and trusted the situation. They could have, they could, they, Paul said in other places, you know, uh, we believe that he's able to raise the dead and all this sort of stuff. So he, he could have believed God in being raised from the dead, but he didn't. They fled and they fled to a place where they preached the gospel and, and a great in the life of one individual, one individual. What a greater purpose. So these fleeing fundamentalists, they fled to a greater purpose. They fled in order to be led. And folks, I want to encourage you with that. Don't get so caught up in, in fussing and fighting over here when there's bigger fish to fry. There's the attention of the fight of faith, the, the, uh, the earnestly contending for the faith. That's all good. That's all right. But let's make sure we've got it in the right area. We've in, we're focused in the right way and not being sidetracked by other things. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lead us and guide us today. Lord, prepare our hearts and our minds for services on the weekend, and bless our day on Sunday as you meet with us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless. Thank you for joining. I appreciate that. Have a great day in the Lord. Look forward to being with you uh, Monday morning for devotions. Remember, last next week is the last week for a couple of weeks. We'll go on holiday and we'll be back in January. So God bless. Have a good day. We'll see you on Monday. Bye for now.